Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Bible 2021 podcast, episode number 12. We are reading Mark chapter 10 today, and our focus is on the difficulties of wealth and privilege. Well, thanks for joining us for Bible 2021 podcast. We are daily 10 minutes of truth per day, focused on the Word of God, reading one chapter of the Bible per day. Five days a week, we'll read a New Testament chapter, two days a week, an Old Testament chapter. Welcome aboard to new listeners from New South Wales, Australia, Lagos, Nigeria, Assam, India, Houston, Texas, Dallas, Texas, Terre Haute, Indiana, and Anchorage, Alaska. Thank you for listening. Our focus is on daily Bible reading. You can jump on any time. You don't have to backtrack. Just join on, grab hold, and get into the Word of God daily. Please share uh, us with uh, your friends and family on social media and in person. And it would be awesome if you could go to Apple Podcasts and leave a review for the Bible 2021 podcast. You can catch our website, Bible2021.com. And if you have questions or comments, there's a contact page there, Bible2021.com. Today we see another instance in Mark 10 of Jesus getting angry. And the reason is a bit surprising. This time he's angry at his own disciples, or at least indignant with them, because they are forbidding parents from bringing their children to be touched by Jesus. Now, how does Jesus manage his anger? Does he blast his disciples? Does he side-tweet them on Twitter? Does he talk about them behind their backs? No. He simply teaches them and helps them understand the value of children and the value of approaching the kingdom of God with a childlike faith. Well, today's focus is not so much on that, but on the dangers of wealth and privilege. And yes, you heard me right. Now, most people, of course, consider privilege and wealth to be a good thing in many senses, or at least a remarkable advantage. Interestingly, though, the Bible does not exactly treat wealth as an advantage in spiritual terms, but rather as a potential hindrance and a strong temptation. Now, that is not at all to say that it is a sin to be rich or a sign of the blessing of Satan or something like that, because material blessing can and often is, in the Word of God, a sign of God's blessing. For instance, in Genesis twenty four thirty five, the servant of Abraham says, The Lord has greatly blessed my master, and he's become rich. He's given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, and, and so on. So that said, Those that are rich don't have every advantage in the world. Indeed, the most important thing in all of eternity is actually made more difficult to attain if you are rich. So it is possible to see that having great wealth can put you at an eternal disadvantage. What could I possibly mean by that? Well, let's read our passage and find out. Mark chapter 10, verse 1 in the Christian Standard Bible. Jesus set out from there and went to the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Then crowds converged on him again, and as his custom, he taught them again. Some Pharisees came to test him, asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus replied to them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses permitted us to write divorce papers and send her away. But Jesus told them, He wrote this command for you because of the hardness of your heart. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples questioned him about this matter, and he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. Also, if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Now, people were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Don't stop them, because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. After taking them in his arms, he laid his hands on them and blessed them. As he was sitting, setting out on a journey, a man ran up, knelt down before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all of these from my youth. Looking up at him, Jesus loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. 
Go sell all you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But he was dismayed by this command, and he went away grieving because he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Now the disciples were astonished at his words, and again Jesus said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were even more astonished, saying to one another, Then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, because all things are possible with God. And Peter began to tell him, Look, we've left everything and followed you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus said, there's no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the gospel who will not receive a hundred times more. Now, at this time, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields and persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. But many who are first will be last and the last first. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. The disciples were astonished, but those who followed him were afraid. Taking the twelve aside again, he began to tell them the things that would happen to him. See, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him, and he will rise after three days. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, approached him and said, Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask you. What do you want me to do for you? He asked them. They answered him, Allow us to sit at your right and at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Uh, We are able, they told him. Jesus told them, You will drink the cup I drink, and you will be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not mine to give. Instead, it is for those whom it has been prepared. And when the ten disciples heard this, they began to be indignant with James and John. Jesus called them over and said to them, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in high positions act as tyrants over them, but it's not so among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you will be slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a large crowd, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting on by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Many warned him to keep quiet, but he was crying out on the moor, Have mercy on me, Son of David. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called the blind man and said to him, Have courage, get up, he's calling for you. He threw off his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. Then Jesus answered him, What do you want me to do for you? Rabboni, the blind man said to him, I want to see. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has saved you. Immediately he could see and began to follow Jesus on the road. So hear it again. Jesus said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And look, I take from this that it is literally harder for rich people to be saved, which would seem on the surface to be a terrible disadvantage. Now, by the way, the parable or illustration about the camel and the eye of the needle, it means exactly what it sounds like. There was no eye of the needle gate in Jerusalem that camels had to stoop to go through. It means it's hard for rich people to be saved. Hard, of course, says Jesus, but not impossible, because Jesus tells his disciples here that all things are possible for God, by God, and indeed, there were several wealthy followers of Jesus in the early church, including Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, and probably Barnabas, the disciple of encouragement. Now, on this interesting dynamic, the spiritual difficulty of wealth and privilege, C.S. Lewis one time wrote in a letter to his friend, What seem to us the easiest conditions may really be the hardest. And then he quotes from this passage, How difficult it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. So, does that mean it's bad to be rich? Well, I guess my answer would be, that it actually can be spiritually hard to be rich in many ways. But as mentioned earlier, the Bible often shows the material blessing can be a blessing from God. 
How should a rich person deal with a material blessing in a way that is spiritually prosperous? Well, by following Jesus and obeying 1 Timothy 6, which says, Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God, who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share. Storing up treasure for themselves is a good foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of what is really life. So through this lens, we can see that a generous and obedient person of wealth is a great benefit to the kingdom of God and will store up treasure in heaven. Though it might be a temptation in ways and a difficulty in ways to have wealth and riches, it is also an opportunity to store up treasure in heaven and be generous. Well, last thing on the show, our Bible memory verse for January is Mark 1.15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. One more time, Mark 1.15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Amen. Well, may the Lord bless you, friends. Good day to you and Godspeed.